Hello, I'd also like to add my welcome to you all coming today. Um, I know there's lots going on, so it's really appreciated that you take time to come. Um, I'd also like to thank very much uh, Carol and Tao Dan for joining me today. Because although this is uh, a launch which uh, the Salon has been very kind to give me a slot to launch this book, I think that um, the fact of this book is part of a much bigger process uh, of change that's happening in China um, in the art scene, of which Carol and Cao Dan are playing extremely important roles. Um, I should begin just by doing a little self-promotion by saying that this is the book. Um, this is the one that's just come out, which is called As Seen 2. Obviously, it follows on As Seen 1. Um, it came out of a period of me doing um, some pretty intense research on a history-based book, uh, which aims to look at uh, the second period of sort of Chinese artistic development, which is taking place in the 1990s. Um, for those of you who may be not familiar with uh, art in China, um, it sort of really began in the era of opening reform, which started uh, after Mao's death in the late 1970s um, and really sort of got going in the um, 1990s. So we, before the very recent decade, never really had any kind of a system where there were galleries, where there were museums, where artists could show work on anything like a regular basis. It's always been something that was pretty ad hoc. Um, artists would go out and find spaces. And I'd also like to now welcome, this is Wu Shandram, um, who will get fixed up with a microphone in a minute. But the, one of the reasons he's here um, is that he was one of the most important artists to emerge in that first period of art in the 1980s. Um, he was also one who was going out and making exhibitions of his work in any kind of space he could find that in the 1980s, and that this has had a tremendous impact um, on how people were able to see art. His partner, Inga, I see where she just uh, disappeared to, um, they have been working together since the mid-1990s. Wu Shandran has been living in uh, Europe, based kind of in Germany, for uh, much of the period of the 90s. They've been working consistently in an area which is really about exploring what art can be. And the interventions that they've done coming back to China have been really important for how artists in China, in this ongoing process of understanding what art is, have been sort of seeing art that is really about understanding what art is. And they have been, um, there's a wonderful piece of their work that's in the first book from a solo exhibition that they did in 2011 that was in a gallery called the Long March. Um, I, if you've been looking around the fair, you would have seen the Long March space. It's one of the most uh, important galleries in China. Um, because there haven't been galleries for a very uh, long period of time, we've only really had commercial galleries for about the last 10 or so years. What they do really, like many other galleries, functions as an art space, as an art center, as much as a commercial enterprise. Um, they've been very, very supportive of projects like uh, Wu Shandran and his partner Inga, uh, which are re really keen to stay on this exploration of what art can be, um, which is a very important idea in China because in the last few years with the growth of the market, a lot of what art can be has been understood through the prism of what the market expects it to be, how it's being um, priced, if you like. Uh, this has really had something of a diverting impact on the way that people understand artistic practice. So, just to give a little, go back to recapping on the book, um, it came out of the fact that I've been researching this book, uh, which is a historic book, uh, but I realized that there were so many exhibitions taking place, and there were just an astonishing number of exhibitions. And pos uh, to add to that, a great new number of uh, exhibition spaces that were there on a permanent basis. We also have a new generation of create, uh, critics and curators like Carol, who have been consistently working with different art spaces to do uh, independent projects as well as collaborations. And it's that sort of beginning of a consistency of thought and planning um, in, in exhibition making that has really been changing the way that art is being seen in China. And of course, that's coupled together with the rise of the institutions. Carol is now director of a new, well, relatively new institution, which is in uh, Shenzhen. It's called the OCAT, C Contemporary <laughs> Art Terminal. 
And it's kind of one of these new experimental spaces, which is part, uh, well, it's corporate funded, but it's sort of government sanctioned. And they've been doing very consistent work there to put contemporary art um, forward to a, to a public that uh, in Shenzhen never really had the opportunity to see that before. And this reach has now extended to Guangzhou, to Hong Kong. And also, you know, we regularly visit from uh, other cities in China to come and see the exhibitions that they're doing. Um, I decided that given um, the limited, still relatively limited number of uh, publications that there are in China, uh, there are websites, of course, that are reporting on what's happening in Chinese art. But I meet a tremendous number of people um, from the local Chinese audiences, from international audiences. And the question I get asked most often is, how do we find more information about what's going on with Chinese artists? And, of course, everywhere in the world today, there are more and more artists um, emerging and it's increasingly hard to keep up with the number of people who are producing art and also to follow their careers. But um, we've got magazines now like um, Stardan is the editor of Leap magazine, which was born a number uh, two or three years ago, three under, years ago the, yeah. under the tutelage of uh, Phil Tanari, who's now the director of the Ullens Contemporary Art Center in Beijing. Um, Cao Dan has been working there now for the last six months and has taken the magazine on to a new direction. We've got a lot more international views on what's happening in China and also Chinese views on what's happening outside. Um, but in my sort of knowledge of people who are coming in and out of the scene, unless you're in China, you might not know about um, the magazine and it's, it's less easy to find information. So I decided to try and put together a kind of a reflected look at what was happening within these exhibition spaces within a particular time frame. So at the moment we have two volumes that reflects just over two years uh, exhibition activity in China and the goal is to keep that pace up for <laughs> at least sort of like five volumes. Um, also because things change so fast it's very hard for people to have sort of a, a record of what's going on and you know we, we don't always remember things in the way that we'd like to so uh, it's also a way of trying to put into uh, a collected, considered volume, some of the artworks that are really having an impact within China. Um, that impact is important because still a lot of the uh, exposure to artworks, to original artworks that people have is, is relatively limited unless they're able to travel. Of course, the rise of art fairs has been really useful because it puts an awful lot of art in one place for people to have a look at. Um, but again, you know, how, how do they... How do people respond? This is a question that a lot of people in China who are interested in art are now beginning to ask. So, um, the images that you're seeing uh, either side were just put together in a sort of a random kind of way. The, uh, the color ones all reflect exhibitions that have taken place in the last couple of years. Um, and there is a picture in there of your uh, an English show at the Long March, which was a really, really nice show. And then the ones in, the, uh, in black and white are from the 1990s, which just kind of give a little bit of an overview of how different it was um, uh, just just such a, you know, 10, 15 years ago where people were finding, like, the image you're seeing now is of the, se the old Central Academy of Fine Arts building that was in the centre of the city before it got demolished. Um, and that was, that was used for an impromptu art exhibition in 1995. So, um, it's not... I hope you have a chance to go and look at the books, but I really also would like to give a chance for you to hear the experiences of um, the guests here today. And maybe I could start by asking Wu Shanzhuan, who left in 1990, 1989, and, but who's been coming back. So when you see the change as you come back, you know, the fact that you were made a, a very strong exhibition in a like the Long March, which is a commercial space last year. They, he also has, they just opened a show two days ago in the OCT, which is where Carol is um, the director now, which is a really, really interesting show. And uh, if you do have the chance to pop across the border, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, they also have a talk uh, tomorrow afternoon in case anybody has time to go. How do you find making exhibitions in China today? Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> You came to listen, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So it's, it's good. Do you think it's changed in any way that's been helpful to you? Or? It always changes everything. It changes if it means any way. Yes. But in a way that mean, is more meaningful for you to make art or to present art in the way that people respond to it? Do you? I don't know. I, just, I, I feel fine. Okay. <laughs> Feels fine. Carol, maybe you can talk us a little bit about what you're doing with the OCT and uh, how you are pro how, what, how you program the exhibitions. Sure, OCAT was um, founded um, in 2005 by an art critic in China, uh, in very active in the Pearl River Delta called Huang Zhuan. And when he first um, founded the art center, the art center was still part of a state-owned museum in Shenzhen called He Xiangning. So the contemporary art center was really more like a department in the state-found uh, museum. But in the art center, which whose space is independent from the museum, um, he started to develop a series of very intense program looking very in-depth at individual, individual artist practices. And in the context in China, as you were describing, that we have a very new institutional scene, also have a a very young kind of uh, thing in terms, in terms of diversity of curatorial approach. Um, his, um, his goal and his programming in the art center really um, established a very important model in terms of looking at uh, individual artist practices because um, what you can what you could see in the past two decades in China most of the exhibitions try to present only certain projects of an artist's lifelong uh, career and most of the thinking most of the perception of an artist's work was very much driven by um, this is generalization, but I am uh, daring with gener generalization here to say that most of the um, interests and most of the uh, perception of artist work were very, very short term based. So people are looking at certain works, certain icons, certain series of products rather than considering an artist's work as a lifelong practice. Um, so I think he's what interested me about this institution from the very beginning was his interest and his investigation into an, an artist's long-term thinking, an artist's practice. And when he, when he was running the institution, he mostly worked with artists from his generation. So artists like Zhang Xiaogang, uh, Wang Guangyi, Wang Jianwei, um, Wu Shanzhuan. Um, um, it's artists that he grew up with. So artists he had very intimate relationship with. Artists he knew um, extremely well. He lived with them, he talked with them, he, he grew up with them in art. And that kind of intimacy and that kind of um, bonding in, in their thinking um, and in their practice is really paid up in the exhibition that he, he presented and he curated in, in the institution. Another in important focus that he has established for the institution is uh, the importance of publication. Um, the publication for OCAT is very little, just a reflection about the exhibition itself, but more as a, a study of an artist's work. So the publications really are very valuable monologues about an artist monologues. And I'm saying this to an audience who are probably familiar with another mode of production in in other countries where you, you can encounter different variety of, of artist publications. Whereas in China, this kind of in-depth in -depth look at an artist thinking, a, a kind of long-term investment and involvement in an artist's long-term thinking is very rare. So mm. I would say that that laid a very important foundation for the institution. And I took over the institution from last July. And since I joined the institution, on one hand, I tried to continue this line of working by working very closely, closely with artists that have been practicing in China for the last three decades. We have a very young art scene here, I would say, in that sense. But we have very many um, 
interesting players and practitioners who have been very involved in the art scene from the very beginning and have a very interesting story mm -hmm. uh, spanning over three decades. So I've been trying to work, continue working with this type of artists and practitioners, but I also try to bring in international projects to OCAT. Last September, for instance, we had a project by Boris Groys, who curated an exhibition of the French philosopher Alexandre Kojev's uh, archive of photography. Um, this year, we are traveling an exhibition titled Animism to OCAT, which was curated by Anson Frank, and it's an exhibition that has um, started in uh, um, Belgium and Berlin and was just presented in New York. But when I bring these exhibitions to China, one of the key thinking that I have behind it is not only just to bring an exhibition or to bring an international artist to China. I try to think about the relationship it has with the local context. So to, to, to do that, um, I try to engage the curator or the artist that come to China um, with uh, to engage them with local mm -hmm. art critics, local artists, to develop conversations with them, to develop a series of either lecture series uh, or discourse programming to expand the thinking and to link the kind of thinking to the Chinese context. Mm -hmm. and, and in all of this um, institutional practice, I would say behind it there is an, a very important um, belief in, um, for one, institutions uh, as active producers and participants of the art scene. So institutions, I believe that institutions don't just provide service uh, for artists, but institutions should work with artists and, and grow and in interact with artists very closely, interact with practitioners and thinkers. And on the other hand, I also believe that institutions are equal as artists. Mm -hmm. So in a sense that we, we face the same kind of creative challenges in the process. Um, I'm probably um, going a bit uh -huh. too long, no, but uh, just to, to summarize, that right. would be the two of the kind of very fundamental thinkings mm -hmm. behind how I try to approach right. OCAT at the moment. Okay, and uh, just to give a little bit more background about the OCAT, um, this is an institution that's really thinking about how it can build and develop its position uh, culturally in China, and last year um, decided that it would open a number of kind of sister um, institutions in Shanghai, in Wuhan, in Xi'an, and there will be a research center in Beijing, which uh, uh, Carol uh, mentioned, Huang Zhuan, he's moving uh, up to head the research center, uh, which I think is a really interesting aspect of um, uh, how institutions are developing in China as well, because the aspect of research is really something that's very imp important. Um, so much of what happened in the 80s and 90s is really only recorded in the, in the kind of personal archives of, of a number of critics or perhaps a number of artists, but then each one of those is only really sort of very partial. And I think for younger critics and younger kind of art <coughs> historians or theorists who are trying to understand what's happened uh, in, the, in, in their own cultural environment, actually it's, uh, it's, I mean, luckily there are a lot of people that you can go and interview, but there's not a center or a resource place that people can actually go to, which I think is what the Beijing uh, OCT Research Center will, will aim to be doing. Um, Saudan, you, you spent many years living in France uh, before you came back to work with the magazine. You know, often being outside of a country, when you come back, it gives you a much clearer perspective. What would you see as being kind of like the biggest uh, um, characteristic, if you like, of what's happening in, in China with the art at the moment? And, you know, what, what are the areas that you see as being re really important to develop through what you can do with the magazine? Uh, before I come back to China, I work, I'm not working in the media. I'm not working in the publication. But uh, when I come back, I, I learn, I learn with on working. And I find uh, it's so interesting period after I live in France for 15 years old, 15 years ago. I, I find China now is uh, a very s 
interesting period, uh, the period with uh, the movement, the change of political um, evolution. Mm -hmm. And so I think art, the, 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 uh, the center of art change now. And we see so many young generation, young artists, they grew up, they, they, they do their creation. It's different from, I think, the generation like uh, Mr. Wu Xianzhuan. And they have their mission, they have their um, uh, cr um, point of view. And I, I think that's it's a very exciting uh, moment now uh, for me to work in the um, media about art. Mm -hmm. So I, our mission, the, the LIP is a magazine, a bilingual magazine. So we have um, the mission, uh, it's very challenge um, work because we, we are bilingual. We must thinking about our readership because we have a readership from the outside of China and also the Chinese people, the Chinese readership. So to, to, to that is very difficult to, to for us to produce um, the contents uh, for the readership, because we must thinking about always thinking about two readership. Mm -hmm. Some people they don't know any about our contemporary arts, and some people they know very well, well about art. So we must combine combine these two uh, sp um, aspect for the for our readership. Mm -hmm. So that that is a challenge work, and I will try to to to, to be a, a bridge, a bridge from the Chinese. China and uh, overseas, outside of China. So that's our mission. And yeah, mm -hmm. if um, you want it, to... We should perhaps give just a little background too to say that um, really until very recently there were very few publications in China um, that, that dealt with art and those that exist tend to be very much um, academic publications, uh, you know, good publications, but really read by a very small circle of people, either who themselves are engaged in theory or who are working in the, in the art world. So one of the interesting shifts has been to see how people are able to address audiences of what we now think of as being an intelligent reader, an educated person who is becoming really interested in, in learning about art, and bridging that gap um, where people are more used to uh, certainly within the, the art magazines, more used to writing sort of pure theory and, you know, in-depth in, uh, in analysis that perhaps is not always so accessible for people who are just coming into the scene. But maybe, Karen, I could, I could bring a question to yes, you and yes. Wu, because um, I didn't experience personally the 90s in China, and even though what you have been describing uh, earlier in the conversation and uh, both the Cao Dao and I seem to be contributing to is a phenomenon of a kind of uh, a flourishing of institutions and infrastructure mm -hmm. in China at the moment, which we we didn't really have the luxury of having uh, for practitioners like Wu, even mm -hmm. in the 80s, and mm -hmm. for you who have experienced the 90s mm -hmm. in China. But from the interviews and from the conversations and from the, the materials that I have read about the early periods in the contemporary art scene in China, that was also a very lively scene. Um, people, uh, the, the way I tend to describe it is the individuals as institutions. Mm -hmm. The individuals were really, uh, the, the artists were curating exhibitions, mm -hmm. um, the, the players, the editors, there wasn't even a term of curator, but the editors who work for art magazines, they were trying to have the artists organize exhibitions. And exhibitions happen in different places, in any place that you, as you were showing here. I, I personally don't think that even with the flourishing of institutions and publications today, that the value has diversified so much or the energy has necessarily gone up so much. Mm -hmm. What is your view on this? Well, I think one of the things that I think is the biggest shame about uh, events that took place in the 1990s was that so few people got to see some of what I still think was the most dynamic and exciting events that have taken place. I mean since the market exploded and since you know art has become somehow you know legitimate in in china today and everything seems to be becoming regulated there is a kind of a you know everything everything becomes very as you might imagine it to be 
and because of that, it ticks all the boxes about being, um, you know, about society, about politics, about the, the current thinking, uh, about the right media, about the right forms, but at the same time, um, something of the spark that you could get from seeing artworks put in a basement somewhere or in a green room in a theatre. Um, you know, these were events that would be there for three hours. You know, it would be there for as long as the opening. Um, people would go in with a suitcase maybe with artworks and just kind of put them up. You know, people would come along and it would be the people that you managed to tell and the word would go around. Um, there was really something rather magical about being able to see work like that, and I think it was because it felt so fleeting and ephemeral almost that it, it gave it an added impact. Um, of course, it's very hard to say whether uh, that kind of like pop up, I mean, that's the current kind of like trendy phrase for doing things in unexpected places. We see all kinds of pop up events happening, and somehow that's um, in a world where you already have the institutions, it has less, in a way, less of an impact because it's trying to go back to something that you, you can't fabricate that kind of a system um, that is closed to art in a formal way. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to, to invent something like that. But I think it's what, what, it, what I notice is the big difference now is the way that artists in some ways are thinking about the audience that looks at their art because the way it's presented and for the time frames it's presented in, that makes a difference to how people conceive of things. Um, I think the reason why a lot of art from the 1990s was, you know, not thrown together, but it could use materials that people didn't have to think about those materials lasting for very long. Nobody had any idea about a market. There was no idea that there would be any market value. Therefore, you could use things that, you know, could look good now, but you didn't have to worry about what would happen to them in, in five years, ten years' time. Um, and, I, and I think that that has changed the production of art. You know, we see a lot of very big productions of pieces, you know, things that can be done really well. I mean, the work that uh, Wushantran and Inga have uh, in the OCT at the <laughs> moment, what struck me about it was that it is, you know, this, it's seamless in its production. It's so beautifully done. And that requires time, and it d requires devotion, and it, you know, it requires a certain in integrity to, to stick with that. When you have a very short time frame, you tend to be a little more um, you know, casual about it, perhaps. Um, I mean, you know, here we have a good example. These were, this is 1992. These are paintings by Yue Min Jun, who was the first artist to go above a million. And there they are hanging on a tree in a forest, because that was the only place that they could go and make an exhibition. So I think, you know, oh, you're right, you know, who was saying everything changes, of course it always changes. We wouldn't want things to be the same. Um, there are always benefits, there are always, uh, you know, I wouldn't call them deficits, but things definitely change in that period. So I think, um, I don't know what time, do we have any questions? Maybe we should see if anybody would like to ask any questions. Uh, to both Karen and Tardan. Tardan, you mentioned that um, the, the mission, that the younger generation, this new generation, have a, their own mission. Um, but what, what perhaps is that mission? And I suppose the same question for Karen is um, the fact that perhaps the, the, the sanitization or the, the legitimization of so much of the institutions in mainland China, does that affect what art is being produced by these younger generation? Um, I think the mission I don't think the, the the young generation they have the same mission uh, compared with the the artist who is working at the uh, 80s at the beginning of 80s. So this generation is more um, individual individualized. So they have their own more concrete mission themselves. So uh, I can. For example, the exhibition of on off, and we can see the each uh, different they are artists. They have their own um, society, social uh, conscience, conscience. They are critical sense, but they are not the the, the generation. They have the same like uh, um, um, some kind of um, um, idea, the the common idea to to work. So I think. Uh, the media, like the, the our magazine, just want to show or uh, discover this their 
their dialogue, their language, with very concrete uh, interview or um, article and comment. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, I think what, what, what really is the base here is the, you know, artists like Wu Shanzhang came, they came, it was a very collective society at that time. People worked together, um, obviously, because it was just the, the, the easier way to actually get things done. But I think the younger artists today grew up in a world where they're so uh, worldly in a way, you know, their opportunities to travel, their opportunities to go around the world just to look at art, to visit art exhibitions. They participate in a number of international exhibitions. So I think that that um, is, is giving them, you know, the internet has really changed the way that people interact. Uh, in China, and also the the information that you have at your fingertips. So younger artists, I think, in framing what the idea of an artist is, would be quite different to to the other generation. I mean, you were there was so much idealism, um, and and really pure ideas of art. And I know that we sometimes use these words about like purity and whatever, which seem a little bit sort of um, hard to articulate because. Uh, I don't know, it, it, that, take, that takes us in a slightly different direction. But what I mean is that there's a, there's a much more concrete idea of what an artist is and the steps in order to do that for amongst the younger generation. So, you know, they would see themselves as needing to have gallery representation, as needing to be in X, you know, biennales or whatever by a certain date. Whereas, you know, the older generation were just really about changing the world in a way, you know, with ideas because there was a real belief that art could impact the way people saw the world because I guess Mao had demonstrated in a way that, that art did have a reach and a, and, a, and a powerful expression for a particular ideology. And although the ideology that they were expressing was you know, completely contrary, it was, it was the uh, uh, you know, taking issue with, with a lot of that uniform idea about um, what art was. But I still think that there wasn't an idea about being, you know, how you lived as an artist or how you set up your career as an artist. Whereas I think today that's that's very clear, and in a way that does change the way that people produce art because there's a very, um, you know, if you go to a lot of biennales, I think that there's a real kind of feel about the international art that's being produced um, that deals with, you know, you, you're, you're having biennales now which deal with artists from all over the world, all different cultures, um, and I think that it. It's, it's very difficult for a visitor to be able to understand every single culture, you know, to have the knowledge about China, the Middle East, South America, to be able to bring a specialized knowledge to a particular political statement, for example, which is where the art seems to come to a more kind of internationalized uh, practice about commenting on certain ways. And I think that that's reflected in the, in the style of art that's being produced today in many ways. I want, very round yeah, I want to it. remind also the, the generation like um, Wu Shanzhuan and uh, Zhang Pei Li, they are the professor, they, they, they became the f professor of this young generation. So they, when they go to school, they oh. learn, <laughs> <They're> not <laughs> you, <laughs> but, but <laughs> I know, and the but same they, generation, they I mean. tremendously, yeah. I mean, so, that's, so you know. So that, that's the second generation of the, I think, the, 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 art, the, the artists, contemporary artists in China. Yeah, and... Um, yeah, I, I heard about, I, 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 we are on screening the film, uh, a documentary film in our booth, a multimedia booth. It's a, a, a documentary about the exhibition on off. And this very interesting, if you have time, you can go to see. It's in the booth of S, S Night. Yeah. And uh, you can, there's many interviews with the young generation artists and also with uh, uh, the, um, the director of UCCA. And I heard th this uh, there is a, um, a very interesting opinion. Is uh, the young artists do not only face the, young, the artists Chinese Chinese artists they're not facing the Zhongnan Hai, the government. Uh, they're also facing the Wall Street. Wall Street. So. <laughs> okay. But maybe I I can add and and maybe we will um, contribute as well to. To my thinking, actually, uh, I still think that art practice is very individualized, no matter whether it's when Wu was very active in the 80s, 90s, or today. And if you are seeing the visual artists, the anxiety of being an artist, the anxiety of what they should do, uh, how they um, continue with their practice, I think that kind of anxiety has never changed. So in, in that aspect, 
I don't think there is so much difference in, in terms of different generation of artists uh, in their concern, in their thinking about what art is and what that practice should be. Sorry. The, um, my perception is, but I'm rather ignorant, was that, that the art of the 80s and 90s was um, an art that was against the kind of um, orthodoxies, the, the, the old ideas. And then that um, the government in about 2001, perhaps with the Shanghai Biennial, decided that this wasn't a dangerous animal, that in fact it could be tamed. And um, that since then, that the artists are tolerated and unless they go very far, like Ai Weiwei, they, um, uh, they have the role perhaps of the jester at the medieval Western court who was allowed to say outrageous things and everybody said, well, that's just the jester. Don't pay any attention. Is, is this true? Or is it still, is there still that feeling <coughs> of risk and of, um, of, of, of um, protest? Um, this is always kind of a difficult question to answer because I think that, uh, you know, obviously we ask this question because it's China. Um, and I guess having lived in China for such a long time, I've been there for 20 years, that, you know, Carol, she's right, just talking about how individual everybody is. I mean, I think that an awful lot of things happen. Um, and, I, and I don't feel that for a lot of things that happened that there was a particular eye making the judgment call that you're suggesting. You know, I, uh, and I think that um, a lot of... Uh, certainly, it seemed, like, in the 1980s, that because modernization economic was so focused on economy that what happened with the art was kind of like you know I don't think people were even considering it particularly until the events of 1989 perhaps but I, I think that it's sort of um, I know that the way you expressed it is a very neat you know kind of metaphor but somehow it just doesn't feel exactly like that because I think that we, we're seeing a different kind of engagement you know what it precludes in a way is work, you know, for example, by an artist like Wu Shanjian and Inga, who are so influential amongst other artists because they've always stuck to a real true idea of, you know, exploring something that's art. Now, you know, when they, then when you look at the art, you might be expecting to see something political. Now, politics might be what you read into it or what you don't read into it. But what they're thinking about is perhaps something part of a larger system which allows people to think about space, about existence, about how you understand form or whatever, but it's not directly political. And I think the, the kind of a little bit of the problem with the way that it, you know, it, it's phrased like that kind of assumes that every artist has to be making political art. And I'm not sure that that's you know, what every artist dreams of doing in a way. And that sort of politics or kind of a meaning is found in something that's not perhaps expressed as directly as being political. Uh, I don't know, thanks. Carol, did you? Um, <coughs> well, personally, I'm very inspired. And um, I have written um, many times about Ai Weiwei's practice and his works. And I ask myself, as someone who works in China today, um, how can I be ignorant of what's happening around us? And how can I be engaged in some kind of political acts without addressing directly and without putting myself to jail? And without being uh, com having come from a privi privileged family like I, who can be immune from certain dangers. And I think by asking myself this kind of question, I also slowly to develop maybe a more diverse understanding of what being, a po being political could mean in China and what are the means of being political um, are available to us. 
and one of these ideas is translated into, for instance, to establish a public program in the art center I'm running right now. If you go to uh, many, most of the uh, institutions, art museums in China, there is no, not a single place for children to have education in art. And for me, by establishing something like that in an art center, by initiating a program for our kids, for our next generation to expose themselves to the different ideas in art can also be political. So I think being inspired by Ai Weiwei, I keep pushing myself to think, how can I be political uh, without being in political in a certain way and being implicated in, in in that kind of punishment or system. But still, I'm very energized personally and inspired by Ai Weiwei's gesture and his involvement and mostly his courage, I would say. One very last question. This one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just talking about the documentation, Karen, of um, Chinese art through the 1980s and 1990s, um, I'm just wondering, and, and with Leap Magazine and um, other forms of documentation that have been coming out of China, I'm just wondering if the artists themselves are actually reading um, those texts about China's art history. I think I think most people uh, are very well read uh, and informed. Um, you know, a lot of <coughs> a lot of uh, the documentation that's coming out, artists are now um, being quite proactive in giving their own documentation to the Asia Art Archive here in Hong Kong, which has become a really important centre for gathering all of the information about things. And I think obviously not just China, but putting that in the context of Asia. Um, so I think that, um, you know, if you if you look back to, uh, there are a number of, uh, the most important books that are, are written about uh, kind of what's happened so far in China are in Chinese. I think there's very, there's relatively little that's still in English that's as comprehensive as it is in China. So all of the Chinese critics have written rather significant tomes uh, on, on art. Um, and of course, as Kara mentioned earlier, with someone like Huan Zhuan, who's bring, been doing in-depth research on particular artists. And I think that these, these books do get very widely read. And I would wonder if not particularly amongst the younger generation who are interested in learning, you know, very often they hear about uh, the importance and significance of certain events that took place in the 80s. But, you know, obviously it's only by reading these books that they're able to, to get an idea because we still don't have a single place that's able to give a display, a permanent display of art history or, you know, any context for art history that has any real meaning. So, <laughs> was that, was, okay, we're out of time, I'm really sorry. Thank you so much for coming today and being such an attentive audience. Thank you. <laughs>